Our second speaker for the session is Professor Paul Miles. Paul is Director of Anaesthesia and Perioperative Medicine at the Alfred Hospital. Paul is an editor of the British Journal of Anaesthesia and an editorial consultant for The Lancet. The main focus of his research has been on patient quality of recovery and avoidance of post-operative complications and in large multi-centre trials in anaesthesia. Paul's going to provide us the clinician researcher's perspective, measuring impact on individual clinical practice. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, yes, I'd like to talk about my experience, I guess, with um, as a clinician researcher about how I believe the research I and others are conducting uh, impacts on how I go about doing what I do day to day uh, in, in the operating room. And that one's not working. So um, I was uh, the founding chair of the ANSA Clinical Trials Network, which has been going now for certainly more than uh, 15 years. And I really want to talk about that experience uh, with us enrolling more than 40,000 patients undergoing surgery, usually major surgery. Uh, being enrolled into our clinical trials. And I want to focus really only on two particular trials, uh, one um, a number of years ago, one more recent, uh, where I believe there's been a genuine impact on clinical practice. Uh, and I'll start with the first story, which is around the role of um, optimisation or improvement uh, of, or reduction in risk of people having major surgery, and in particular those with known or suspected coronary artery disease. In 2002, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association put out guidelines around perioperative care uh, for patients with cardiac disease. And they identified um, uh, the use of perioperative beta blockers uh, as an important component uh, of reducing risk. And they had a class one recommendation that patients, in fact, should be started on beta blockers uh, if they're undergoing uh, major vascular surgery, and they had a level class 2A recommendation that in fact um, any patient undergoing any sort of major surgery, if they've got known or suspected coronary disease, uh, that should be commenced. So that was the guideline based on some evidence. Now what was that evidence? Well in actual fact there were only two randomised controlled trials that more directly assessed some aspects of that issue. And the first was by Dennis Mangano and colleagues who published in the New England Journal in 1996. Now, this was a randomised trial of only 200 patients. They underwent major surgery and, and a tenolol was commenced uh, roughly uh, about an hour or so before the major surgery and they found a survival benefit out to two years in uh, patients who'd been commenced on a beta blocker. But in fact, uh, as many of you will recognise, this is a very small trial. They only enrolled males. It was only in the VA hospital system in the US. In actual fact, 8% of the patients who were randomly assigned to the placebo group had been on beta blockers already as maintenance treatment for their coronary artery disease, and they were acutely withdrawn from that at the time of surgery. And bizarrely, in the trial design, they excluded deaths in hospital and only counted deaths um, post-discharge and found what I would call a borderline result. The other paper, uh, which is now, we now know is more contentious, and even at the time it was, uh, this was a, again a randomised controlled trial from the Netherlands, also in New England Journal. They only enrolled 112 patients after screening many, many hundreds and identified a really remarkable uh, reduction in cardiac death or myocardial infarction um, after surgery. But in fact, this was an unblinded study. It was stopped early. There were very few events on which the findings were based. And of course, there was a, a really, what, what I would call an unbelievably or unexpectedly large treatment effect that probably couldn't be true. If it were true, I think we would have recognised it many years earlier. So that's the evidence on which these class one or two way recommendations have been made by the American Heart Association. So um, we, uh, in, or in fact it was set up by PJ Devereaux from McMaster University in Canada, working with our trials group in Australia led by uh, Kate Leslie, uh, undertook the POISE trial. And that was designed as a very large uh, multi-centre international trial looking at the potential value of um, commencing uh, perioperative beta blockers in patients having major surgery. Now, interestingly, when I put this trial through our um, 
to our ethics committee, they asked first of all that we needed um, uh, endorsement, um, if not um, uh, um, to be allowed to actually enrol surgical patients into what that was seen as an anaesthesia trial. That irritates me a little bit. Um, nevertheless, I spoke to the head of the vascular surgery unit and we, I got a very strongly worded letter back saying that we as a unit are of the stronger belief the evidence of beta blockers is convincing and therefore to randomise half our patients to a, a, what is clearly a beneficial treatment effect is unacceptable. So, uh, luckily, our ethics committee, in fact, approved us to enrol patients into the trial, but they included a special condition, and that was that high-risk vascular surgery patients are to be excluded from the study. I want you to keep that in mind. So, um, PJ Devereaux led a, a, an updated systematic review and meta-analysis after the trial was underway, uh, and they included 99% confidence intervals in this forest plot to really, I guess, to emphasise the point that we need convincing evidence before we really do, um, should, or, uh, or we should change practice, in other words, have the impact that we're all talking about. And in this updated meta-analysis, he identified the fact that there is still sufficient uncertainty uh, as to make a very firm recommendation and certainly one that would preclude enrolment in randomised controlled trials. So luckily for us, the trial was very successful. It was published in The Lancet in 2008. Uh, overall, we enrolled over 8,000 patients. And the primary endpoint of the study was a composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal cardiac arrest. And there was a statistically significant reduction in these cardiac events or, or death um, in patients who'd received beta blocker, something that many people had assumed or believed, um, perhaps, they were right. But one of the interesting things in this trial was that unexpectedly um, and never expected by the trialists themselves or anyone involved in this area, there were more deaths and more strokes in patients who received beta blocker therapy. So despite the positive finding on the primary outcome event, the more compelling and clinically important and therefore impactful finding was that there is probably more harm. And this is a very important finding. It has had a huge impact uh, on perioperative practice around the world, here in Australia and elsewhere. And here's some demonstration of that fact. So this is a pa paper published just last year in the American Heart Journal. It's basically based on registry data of nearly half a million patients having major surgery in the US. And on the plot here, you don't, you don't have to look at the detail here, on the plot here, this is the date at which the POISE trial was published. And um, following the initial guidelines that were produced uh, in the US and other parts of the world, there was an increasing use um, of institution of perioperative beta blockade in patients having major surgery, not just in the US, it's happening all around the world. This use, of course, was much higher in vascular surgery because of the particularly strong recommendations that exi had existed before that time. Immediately following publication of the POISE trial, there was a dramatic reduction, and this has now gone on over the subsequent years. So I guess at least a very clear uh, demonstration of impact in clinical practice of a clinically important question uh, of a very common problem. And, and, and perhaps most importantly of all, just in the last couple of weeks, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society have put out new guidelines around the role of, um, the, of care of patients with cardiac disease, and they now make a clear recommendation that, in fact, beta blockers should not be commenced uh, in the early period before major surgery. Now, I want to just switch now to one more story, and this, I guess, is a more recent story. Our Atticus trial, which has been a difficult trial that I've led over more than 10 years, funded by the NHMRC, uh, we've luckily had two publications this year in the New England Journal of Medicine. I want to talk briefly about the second one, what the implications are or the impact on clinical practice. And it revolves around the use of drugs called uh, the lysine analogue class of drugs uh, that are designed or do reduce bleeding or bleeding complications in surgery. Now, of course, reducing bleeding and even blood transfusion is an important um, consideration in major surgery. Major surgery consumes half of all the blood bank stores of blood 
in any particular hospital system. Now, one of the problems or concerns that clinicians have had over the years is, well, OK, it might reduce bleeding, but does it come at a price or a cost of extra um, thrombotic complications and in coronary artery surgery, particularly graft thrombosis? And there was a series of anecdotal reports, um, some observational data, suggesting that, in fact, there could be a thrombotic risk. And if that were the case, it would obviously completely change practice. And in actual fact, no one had done the definitive large trial to even test that concern. The most recent and complete up-to-date evidence comes from David Henry's Cochrane Review published in 2011, where uh, the weight of evidence, all based on very small trials, is that these antifibrinolytic drugs do in fact reduce blood loss and probably reduce blood transfusion requirements but the lysine analog class themselves, which are now the most widely used group, uh, in fact, that evidence base was not quite so clear, although there was a reduction in bleeding. Uh, whether that's important or not is another issue. Importantly, they made a conclusion that they seemed to be free of adverse effects. Now, some of you or many of you in the room will appreciate that, in fact, most trials don't properly measure or report adverse effects, and therefore a meta-analysis can't possibly even consider or analyse that in any reliable fashion. It's one of the weakest components of most pooled analyses. And of course, a prospective large definitive trial can build that in to the case report and data collection. And we, in fact, set that up, and it was the underlying premise for Atticus trial, was to try and test the hypothesis, does it uh, increase the risk of, of thrombotic complications? And luckily for us, because it's now very common practice, uh, we clearly demonstrated, in fact, there is no excess risk of these adverse events. And if anything, there seems to be uh, some uh, signal that would suggest you could reduce thrombotic risk using a blood that reduces bleeding, which uh, can be explained, but I won't do it today. Now, importantly in this study are the secondary endpoints, because these were, of course, uh, the efficacy endpoints of the study to show does this drug truly provide the benefit that we assume and what is the size of that benefit and what would that mean to clinical practice here and now. And the findings of our study are really quite in, extremely important. We demonstrated for the very first time that if you use these drugs as a routine in coronary artery surgery, you can halve the rate of patients needing urgent reoperation for surgery that night or in the days that follow surgery. That is an extremely important um, patient-centred and cost-conscious um, uh, improvement in healthcare. Of course, we redu demonstrated reduced bleeding, which is, was not a new finding, but we clearly demonstrated that there is, in fact, a marked and important reduction in the need for blood transfusion and the amount of blood transfusion after surgery. So overall, patients received 46% fewer units of blood having cardiac surgery, saving approximately 57 units of blood for every 100 patients having cardiac surgery, with a number needed to treat of only six, and even for reoperation, which is generally rare, uh, a number needed to treat of 71. So these are, for a clinician, very important and practice-informing um, uh, uh, findings. Now, it can be argued or observed that, in fact, in contemporary cardiac surgical practice in Australia, most patients are already receiving these drugs. That wasn't the case 10 years ago. It wasn't even the case five years ago. There has been a practice change for lots of reasons, so we can at least reaffirm that that shift has been a very good thing. But more importantly, because the evidence now is so much clearer and so much more compelling, and we can now completely reduce the concerns regarding thrombotic risk. Uptake now will be much higher and universal and complete, not just in Australia, but in many other parts of the world. And in some types of cardiac surgery where it is very uncommonly used because of concerns about thrombotic risk. We can also demonstrate that there is actually a, an importance of dose. This, it's a drug, so therefore, Drugs require consideration of dose, and we can demonstrate that a higher dose than is most often used is safe and gives you extra benefit over and above what's happening now in Australia. And perhaps outside of cardiac surgery, going across all, all many types of major surgery, particularly in trauma and orthopaedic surgery, because we can now greatly diminish any concerns of risk, uh, uptake rates are expected to be much higher. 
And there is uh, clear cost effectiveness in this. Now, we are going to have to more formally quantify this, and we plan to do this over the next 12 months. But even a back-of-the-envelope um, calculation on everyday cardiac surgery, it saves approximately $1,000 per operation uh, in circumstances where that drug is not used or not used at the correct dose. Now, in Australia, there's about 20,000 cases of cardiac surgery. Worldwide, there's nearly, there's nearly 1 million cases of cardiac surgery a year. So I'm a great believer in designing practical and important um, randomised trials based on the concerns and problems we as clinicians have, concerns that patients and their families have, to actually address these problems in real-world settings where the trial is built into everyday practice so the findings are important, having impact, uh, and then, of course, can um, um, drive uh, improved quality around the world and therefore value. Thanks very much.